Right, good afternoon um, and welcome to this event. So glad to see so many people in the room. Um, and as I was just listening to that announcement, I was thinking the last time I was in here, two phones did go off and everyone was going, oh, is it me? Uh, so it's great to see everybody in here. Um, we've got a fantastic panel this afternoon. Um, so I do want to welcome you all to the Scottish Parliament. I'm the convener of our cross-party group on international development. Um, my name's Sarah Boyack. I'm one of the MSPs for Lothian. And it's brilliant to welcome you to our Festival of Politics 2023. Um, and this year is amazing. It's the, fest it's the 19th festival that we've run um, since the Parliament was set up. And it's aimed at getting debate going, inspiring people, provoking discussion from all ages and every walk of life. Um, so it's really to have a good debate. And that's what we've been doing for the last three days. So it's great to see everyone here because today we are going to be debating um, Scotland, a good global citizen, question mark. And um, I'm going to get you all to start coming in with comments and questions later on. But first of all, we've got a superb panel this afternoon, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, and I'm going to introduce them all. If anyone is um, on Twitter, um, we are hashtag capital F O capital P 2023, if anyone wants to tweet about it afterwards. Um, but I want to move on to our panel now, so really great uh, that we're joined by Tabitha, Peter and Maya. I'm going to kick off with Tabitha um, Nyariki. Yep. And Tabitha is a Race Equality Charter Project Officer at Glasgow Caledonian University. And she is the youngest member of the Scottish Fair Trade Forum Board, which is quite an achievement, I think. Um, so we're really going to look forward to hearing from you later. Um, next along, I'm going to go right to the end here, actually, and then come back to you, Peter. Next, we've got Maya Chimonges Muznoska, and she is from the African Caribbean Asian and Mixed Heritage Association, which she's chair of. Um, but she's also part of the Kenyans in the Highlands. And I did check out before we started, that's the Scottish Highlands. Um, so it's great to have you here as well today. Um, and then last but not least, we're going to have Peter Jackson, who's the Executive Director of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs. And if I was to go through everyone's CV, it would take me some time. So I've just given you the headlines here, but you'll be able to access all this kind of information online. Um, what I want to do is to just kick off and say why it's good for us to be here today and why it's important. Um, we are going to try and have some key questions because for me, the idea is that we have a good discussion and then we all think, what do we do afterwards? And that's us on the panel, but it's also you in the audience. And I'm going to ask each of the speakers to just think about um, two or three questions. I'm going to get them to kick off by saying, what does global citizenship mean to you? Um, how important is it that Scotland does aspire to be a good global citizen? And what have we done to demonstrate good global citizenship? And what more could we do? So with those brief words of intro, I'm going to kick off to you. And you're going to kick off Tabitha this afternoon and have a go at answering those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Over yeah. to you. So um, I think global citizenship to me is particularly a really good topic because I consider myself a global citizen particularly because I'm not from Glasgow or from the UK. So I've moved here and I've been able to expand my horizon by being a global citizen and working in areas like fair trade and within race equality that really looks at the main things of what a gl good global citizen is. So it's being able to belong and, and, and uh, being able to feel like you belong to something that's more than just your national sense of belonging and being able to look at the different issues and inter understanding that the issues globally are intertwined and we have to work together to solve them. So for me, I do find that global citizenship is very important and it's something that we have to strive for. Okay, mm -hmm. that was very good. To the point, next up, Maya. Um, I think for me, I would say that uh, global citizenship is it's, it's a dream or an idea that is not about an individual or about um, a nation. It's our joint responsibility <clears throat> to address global challenges and to be able to act and promote the well-being 
of others. Um, and I think for me, I would say it's more about being each other's keepers to ensure that we're looking, we're addressing issues of um, class, we're addressing issues of, uh, so it doesn't take into consideration your status or your creed, or your nationality. It just looks at you as a human being and what can I do or what can we do to ensure that um, we're looking out for each other and we're being each other's keepers. Okay, and Peter, do you want to kick off? Well, those are excellent responses, and I probably will only just rephrase them. But for me, it's about, I think, thinking about uh, our problems, humanity's problems, as being interconnected and global. And they are most of the big questions we're facing now are questions that require a solution across national borders across continents because uh, if we don't start thinking in terms of uh, the key problems we face in terms of climate especially but but uh, uh, a host of other issues as issue problems that are shared with the rest of humanity I don't think we're going to get anywhere in trying to solve them yeah and I think you've just mentioned global crisis. I mean, for all of you, um, we need to be doing global citizenship now, don't we? But we've got a cost of living crisis, a climate crisis. Is there a way we can join up some of our thinking so that we actually get some practical actions in Scotland um, so that we actually do deliver as global citizen? Any of you have a thought on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's many, many ways we can come together and we can look at how um, we are doing our education, how we're educating our, our young people to be able to look at this crisis <laughs> and being able to involve them while they are young and being able to listen to um, grassroots movements who are looking to make a difference as well. I know the cost of living crisis has affected a lot of so where the funding is going in terms of what that Scotland could be doing in terms of helping the global south or other global um, countries. But just being able to find ways to work with the young people. I always speak about young people because it's always nice to have them in the room. And um, just being able to also look at some of the, the, um, the laws our politicians are looking at in terms of immigration and making them more accessible to other people to be able to come and build our nation and make it a bit more diverse in terms of in multi multiculturalism, which builds and embraces and makes sure that we can fight all these issues that are happening at the moment. Okay, yeah. Peter, can I go to you next? Because I know you've done some research and be interesting about how we practically build on what people think and then get some more action. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I'm part of this, this, this entity called the Global, uh, the, sorry, the Scottish Council on Global Affairs. And one of our chief missions is to raise awareness raise understanding, raise the level of debate about you know, international relations, broadly defined global affairs, broadly defined in Scotland. It's one of our key missions. And as part of it, we wanted to understand how Scottish people understood what it means to be a global citizen, what it means to be an actor in the world. And I mean, there are limitations to Scotland's ability to act in the world because constitutionally international or foreign policy is a reserved issue, but there are lots of ways that Scotland can make a contribution, but we wanted to understand, and we wanted to compare Scottish attitudes with English attitudes, and see if there was a difference and where, and quite often when you go into a bit of research, you go in with preconceived notions and expectations of what you're going to find, and we thought either, who tends to be a little pessimistic, uh, Scottish attitudes to <laughs> Things like you know climate justice, uh, uh, refugees, uh, 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 transitional justice in, in in areas of conflict, were not quite as as uh, positive as they'd been represented in the media often, and uh, and what we found was rather than you know Scottish attitudes or el or else we figured that Scotland would be more positive towards global citizenship as a big concept than, for example, England would be. But what we found was, in fact, th th there, was, there were high levels of support for these key issues of global citizenship, both in, in England and in Scotland. There wasn't much difference, which was very encouraging. Uh, I'm glad to hear there's some support in the audience for, for that as well, which is very encouraging to us, but also a bit of a surprise, and maybe made us think that maybe we'd been a bit too cautious or pessimistic and we'd underestimated levels of support for 
uh, thinking of thinking thinking about the world outside Scotland uh, and thinking about key issues of human rights and and uh, climate justice and energy and things like that. So it was very encouraging. Good. Okay, um, Maya, what are your thoughts about what more we can do, given that you've got those other crises going on? How do we still be a global citizen and, and make the real difference we need to do in Scotland? I think we need to have conversations within our own local communities. Um, it has to start, you know, we just have to go back to basics. And um, I think it's also very important to take into consideration, as we've talked about, the young people, the young generation, and seeing the influence that they have, but also to ensure that the, 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 the citizens, not just the residents, but the citizens are also had when it comes to, um, to issues to do, especially with funding and international funding, and also making sure that, hang on, as much as we're supporting international projects and we're doing a lot of, um, of uh, humanitarian development uh, projects, there's something that on the ground that's being taken, that's been, that's being done to support people on the ground and people in a local community. So ensuring that as much as we're supporting um, the, the international programs, we're not forgetting about the rural uh, um, communities that seem to be forgotten. You know, if you're not in the central belt, you seem to be forgotten and you're constantly fighting and your voice is not heard loud enough. So have those conversations um, with the people who are also on the ground. Okay, I think that's a really important issue about actually being embedded in communities. And we've got lots of organisations of direct links, so we'll maybe come back to that one. Um, the next question I was going to really start off with you, Tabitha, because a, you're part of the Scottish Fair Trade Forum. Um, what can we do on an individual level? You know, we've talked a bit about there about communities. Is there stuff we could do on an individual level and community level where we actually can deliver as global citizens? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots to do. I think first and foremost is educate ourselves. I think once you have the knowledge about the issues and what needs to be done, it's the best, best place to start. And we've also talking, spoken about the um, economic crisis. So I know a lot of um, things like the, for, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum um, need funding for certain activities or all these grass, grassroots um, programs need funding as well. So just being able to also just donate to these things, it could be donating your time, your skills, your money if you do have it, just to be able to be able to um, support this work that's happening because a lot of work that's happening within our communities and within organisations like the Fair Trade Forum that just need support and need the manpower to be able to push this work forward. And also when we're looking at how we're, again, I'll always go back to the youth, how we're engaging the youth in our campaign and how we're helping them use social media to get the word out there and being able to show what's happening, not only in Scotland, but outside Scotland as well, and being able to share good practice with other countries and being able to bring that in so that we are all global citizens solving the same problem. Also going down to how we vote and the policies that we are voting for would be a really, really good thing. So think about who are you voting for? What are you voting for? What are we talking about? What are we bringing into our policies? What are we asking our MSPs to do as well when, uh, when we ask them for what their objectives are for the year or for the, the time they're in power? So being able to have all those things together is a really, really, really good place to start. And also looking at how our institutions of education are also educating us our, our students and making sure that whatever they are teaching is not only just about Scotland but it's about out of the world and how we can work together to impact um, the world in general and work together to make our nation a better place because that's the only way we can get to a place where the world is benefiting from all of us being global citizens. Yeah I mean I think yeah. the point you make about individuals and communities and then local politicians is important. We've got a cross-party group on fair trade and uh, during COVID, we had a really impactful session because we, we spoke to farmers in Palestine, Malawi and Kenya. And we weren't in the room because it was COVID. Neither were they, but we were able to communicate. And, and it was just really empowering hearing about what, what difference it makes when you buy coffee in Scotland that's fair trade, what impact it has on them, or if it's chocolate, all the different things that you can buy that are fair trade. And one of the things we could maybe do more of is use our public sector purchase to buy more fair trade that would have an impact so things like that yeah, absolutely looking at things like that and just being able to also uh, go back to social media and being able to show what what you're doing and highlight all the good work that's happening because it's very very important because there's a lot of good things that's, that are happening particularly when you look at fair trade there's a lot of small groups doing a lot of things but they're not sharing good practice as well so you could find that the 
one public sector is really good at fair trade, but one is not. So trying to share that practice and being able to also challenge each other to make that change and being able to start small as you grow as well. Mm -hmm. And Mai, do you want to come in on that issue as well? Do you know, I have to agree with Tad. I feel like she's, she's looked at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> which is she's saying what I'm saying, um, I was going to say, but I, I definitely the education side of it. And when we're talking about edu education on, 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 a local, uh, on a local basis and also on a national basis, I think it's very important that our actions on a local basis are able to be mirrored um, on a national basis. Um, it's one thing for me as an individual to want to do something to, to protect the environment and then someone else is doing the total opposite. Is one thing for me to say, do you know what, I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna walk to work today to to so that I can save the environment. And then someone else who's saying, "Well, I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna I'm gonna drive. I'm gonna fly. And instead of walking the 10 minutes, I'm just gonna take my car there." So I think it takes a collective. We have to understand. First of all, apart from me just saying this is the definition of what a global citizen is, people need to understand from their own perspective what it is and what they can do to actually make the necessary changes and also being able to engage, embrace and learn about other cultures and the diversity within, within, within Scotland. Scotland is extremely, extremely diverse and because of that diversity comes a lot of knowledge and we can utilise the knowledge to be able to absolutely make Scotland boom. You know, but again, it goes back to being able to have these conversations with people on the ground um, and advocating for education from different perspectives. Um, yeah, I, I advocated for, for education, especially through uh, multiculturalism and to raise uh, global awareness um, from the ground up. So you've both talked about education. You actually work at Glasgow Caledonian. You're at Glasgow Uni in your other day job. So there's something about education that's coming up and about young people in particular. So are we thinking schools, colleges, universities? You've also mentioned social media. Um, do you want to just continue that point there, Maya? I'm definitely going to say, you know, I've, I've, I've had this conversation in the past with people uh, when we talk about Scotland's involvement in the, in the transatlantic slave trade and it's a conversation that seemed to happen and people think that we should have this conversation at secondary school uh, because they think, you know, it's only palatable to kids at secondary school level. Whereas I think these are conversations that we need to start having at preschool. We need to have these conversations so that kids are already engaging in this conversation so that when they go to primary school they have an understanding of what it is and then when they do go to secondary school school it's easy to pick up on the subject because they already know what it's about and it's a subject that they have grown up with just as you would teach about history of any other thing don't miss out on this other part of history but from a very very young age because I think once you get to 12 13 you try to introduce them it's really really difficult to try and get through to young people when they've got to a certain stage they already know what they want to do or have an idea of what subjects they want to do and the kind of way they're going but if you start at a stage where we're talking uh, uh, preschool level, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm an EYP, so if you're talking from a preschool level and you start having those conversations, um, they're not only having the conversations at, at school, they're then going ha home and having the conversations and having conversations with parents and grandparents. And there's a lot of history that's hidden there, but because we're not having these conversations with our young kids at that stage, we're missing history from stories from grandparents and uncles and aunts. We're missing all that. So I think the education level, it doesn't need to wait until secondary school and university to be having these um, big conversations. We can have them so that it's palatable um, to the young children. Okay, so do you want to come in on that one, Peter? Because you're head of the um, uh, Scottish uh, Council on Global Affairs and you work in a university. Is there yeah. much more that we could be doing at every level, preschool, primary, secondary, higher and further education? Well, for me, uh, I think that it, the, the geographic dimension in Scotland is a, is a kind of a particularly challenge because it's easy to come. I live in Glasgow. It's easy for me to come to Edinburgh to do an event. But what we're going to do in the coming year is we're going to offer communities outside the central belt in the highlands and and in the high in the islands an opportunity for us to go to them and hold town hall meetings and maybe work with some schools while we're there to talk about issues like 
for example, the, the war in Ukraine, which I think is on a lot of people's minds, and to try and get a conversation going and make some some contribution to maybe lifting lifting people's understanding a bit, raising awareness. Uh, another issue we were thinking of focusing on was migration, which is a problem that I think is is uh, it's not a problem; it's a challenge that I think that uh, you know humanity needs to understand better and understand its drivers and its and its uh, characteristics. Because while there are every year a few million people migrating to, to different parts of the world, like, for example, Europe or the UK or North America. But the big migration that we've seen is people moving from rural areas to urban areas. And there we're talking hundreds of millions of people every year. And that's a dynamic that is going to create further problems as well. And to understand what's driving it and to understand what's driving waves of migration uh, caused by a climate crisis, by war, to, to, to make people understand better that you know, we don't have to listen to what the government tells us and ministers tell us about to F off back to France. That, that, that's just so misrepresentative of what's happening. And uh, you know, we, have, we have to go out and, 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 and have conversations just as we've been hearing abroad and not just you know, in lecture theaters and uh, at Glasgow Cali or, or, or University of Glasgow, but uh, in areas where maybe these town hall conversations would do more good. Yeah, so we've got, um, we had COP26 in Glasgow and we had the Loss and Damage Initiative, which was great in terms of setting a new frame. It, not spent much on it yet, but we've also got additional programmes in country and we've got lots of really good third sector charitable organisations. Do we need to step that up more so that we support people in country so places like sub-Saharan Africa who are already experiencing climate challenge of not being able to grow food. What more do we do as a global citizen to do that practical support, do you think? I think, again, um, have that conversation, but everyone has to be at the table having this conversation. It is really, really important that, you know, because what you don't want to happen or what is happening is you have a conversation, but someone is missing, so they do their own thing. Have that conversation with everyone at the table doing exactly the same thing. Why are we recycling? What's the importance of recycling? Why are we putting plastic one place? Why are we putting food another place? Why are we putting glasses another place? You know, you go to one council, one council recycles food. Another council doesn't recycle, they put all their food and all their rubbish in one bag. Another one, you know, so I think it's really important if we are going to do something, especially when it comes to climate change, we're all speaking the same language. We're all talking the same language, we're doing exactly the same things. And it's, it, it's literally like clockwise, because if one person does one thing different, there's a domino effect to it, and which is what you are experiencing at the moment. So we need to do more good things and be more organised. More yeah. organised, more Do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, but I think it's also very important to bring a lot of the Global South onto the table. Because mm -hmm. I, I did manage to attend the COP26 and as well as the Conference of Youth as well. I was part of the delegate that was part of that. And there was hardly any Global South members within the rooms or within the conversations. So a lot of solutions were being given and being um, approved or being uploaded, but it didn't really fit some of the solutions that would help the Global South. Yes, it was a good conversation to have, but the access and just being able to have them on the table and actually talk about real issues within their countries, because I think there's this perception where the Global North or think that they have the solutions to fix the Global South, whereas the solution is within the Global South, they just need the help of the North to be able to come up with a solution. So just being able to sit on an equal table and have these discussions and find a way to, to work in a way that works for both in a very fair and very, not one is more powerful than the other, because there's still that imbalance of power that's come post-colonialization and post-slavery that's still there. So looking at being able to say, we are coming together as a globe, because as a globe we are dying because of climate change and all these issues. How can we work together to bring us all into a place where we are all living in a very sustainable and equitable world? Okay, so we're all here in the parliament. There's been a lot of talk about Scottish global citizenship, what you can all do as individuals. Um, what more would you like to see politicians do to truly deliver a good, good global citizenship? Who wants to kick off with that one? Well, I think, uh, 
they could support initiatives that do many of the things that that both Tabitha and and uh, Maya have been advocating, which is going out into communities and not just you know interested people who turn up to events like this, but maybe going into schools and underlining to students and to and to local communities this interconnectedness that I think in different ways we're all emphasizing. But in fact, and that's where I would only disagree with you slightly, Tabitha, I don't think the North or the South have the solutions. It has to be a, an approach where everyone has a voice. So we understand the problems. And, and uh, uh, to me, getting the conversation going and raising awareness and understanding in Scotland is, I think, a vital step. Okay. Just to say, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to say anyone in the room got a question, a comment. So just start thinking about your questions. Do you want to agree there with Peter? or? Yeah, no, absolutely. I do agree. And I think uh, maybe I didn't communicate well enough when I was, when I was speaking before. But I, I do agree that it we needs to be an equal seat at the table. And it hasn't been. And the, yeah. of, there hasn't been. And, and that, that is the issue. You made that point yeah, about yeah. race. There's a point about young people, yep. there's a gender yep. issue, but make sure everybody is real it's access. On the table, yeah. yeah. Once you have everyone in the table, they're able to bring in their views from their perspective, and in that way you can find a collective way to solve all these solutions um, in, in a way that works for everyone, even though that sometimes is difficult, but in a way that seems fair for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, you want to come in on that one? What, what should politicians be doing? <laughs> I've, I've got a long list, but I think for me it's four main things. Um, I, I'd like to see politicians committing to work with external bodies who have the same values. Um, I'd like to see politicians be realistic with, real, realistic with their targets and goals, uh, because I'm not sure half of the time where the targets and goals come from. Some of them are, so, some of them are achievable um, and some of them are unrealistic. Uh, I'd like to see politicians ensure that the resources allocated to international projects and developments have also been promoted within our own local communities, especially uh, the rural demographics and not just central belt. And I would also like politicians to practice what they preach, especially around global challenges and um, to be a voice um, for the people don't, that don't have a voice. No pressure. I'll have to communicate that back to colleagues. But there's quite a lot in there, isn't there? That, that thing about working with external bodies, um, that's one of the things this Parliament's very keen to do. So when we have people around the committee and we do an inquiry, we invite people to come back and actually be a witness mm -hmm. and give evidence at the Parliament. Um, we always have a lot of debate over targets and goals, especially climate at the moment. Mm -hmm. What is our commitment not just to have targets on climate change, but actually deliver them. That is a massive issue. Um, and your point about resources, that goes everywhere, doesn't it? Every project needs proper funding. Um, and then the practice what we speak. So a lot of nice little challenges in there. Um, you have anything you want to add, Peter, before I go at the audience? Just to say that we were living in, because I'm, I'm an historian actually in my training, in my worldview, and we're living in a moment where populism is more pervasive and popular and practiced than at any point since the 1930s. And it's uh, a responsibility we all have to kind of, uh, to me anyhow, to reject these narratives about what separates us and what makes us different and how we don't have the same interests as other people and think about we have responsibilities to each other. And if we can educate people and, and nurture that support that we found in, the, in that survey, then it will become easier for politicians to raise taxes, to, to spend money on, on, on projects that might not seem to the average person at the moment to be a good use of public funds, but are actually vital for, for uh, our, our children, our future, our children. I don't mean, I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay, well, we've had a really good conversation there with our three panel speakers. Um, and I want to open it out to the audience now and get you involved in this discussion. So uh, if you want to speak, just stick your hand up and I will work my way around the room and see who wants to make a comment. So no pressure. Because uh, there was that thing about individual people need to get involved. 
need to have the conversation, the dialogue. Uh, so over to you guys, who would like to kick off? Who's got a question or a comment you want to bring in? I see three people. So I'm going to start off with you first. And just as ever, if you just say your name. Okay, Vanessa, oh, start. And get I, the... I wasn't born in Scotland, but I, I've lived here 35 years and I really appreciate the fact that people are valued and people from wherever we are gifts. Um, I'm, I'm involved in the interfaith relations, which is um, the Scottish Interfaith Council, but it's um, there's so much we can learn. There's an attitude that uh, amongst some people that um, them and us, you know, the them and us attitude and they're dependent and we are sort of <laughs> patronising sort of attitude. But there's so much richness in Scotland's population and we are gifts to each other. And for example, over half of the uh, faith groups live a very simple, sustainable life, um, they're vegan and they and care for the earth. And I was at the COP26 climate, le uh, the faith leaders um, summit where everybody agreed on the importance of caring for the earth for us and for future generations, all of the faith leaders. And that was the theme throughout. And it was wonderful to meet with some of the um, indigenous people from Bolivia and Peru who came uh, at, I, I met them in Govan at the, um, uh, the, the institute there, that, uh, what's it called? Um, anyway, and one of the places they liked to go, they, they enjoyed most, was the Galgale Centre, which is a very hands-on community oriented. So it's about community, the values of community, of relationships, which we valued during COVID particularly, and all, and dance and being outside, Scotland's moving outside, you know, cele celebration, and, um, and being able to grow your own food, that's an, an important thing, you know, you know, and valuing young people and valuing old people and the gifts that the older generation have in um, nurturing the young. So, so many things. Riches, thank you. Okay, that's a great start. And, and then right along at the front, and again, if you just give us your name and then comment or question, that'd be super. Hi, my name is um, Cathy Gunn, and um, unlike yourself, I was born in Scotland, but I've lived overseas for the last 30 years. Um, I was in academia as well. I worked in the University of Auckland in New Zealand, so I know that the academic focus is one thing, and I think the research is great. This is a really complex set of issues we're talking about, but I'm going to just ask a really simple question, and I will ask it of Peter, because... You were the one who spoke about the research, looking about people's attitudes in Scotland and England and were they different, and you found that actually they weren't. Um, what would you have done if you had found that they were different, and what actually are you going to do with the information that you got from that survey? I'd just love to hear more about it. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, it's going to be published, and the raw data will be available on our website the Scottish Council, and we're very keen. We're about to launch a membership drive. And membership's not going to be expensive because we're hoping to attract lots of people. But the website at the moment is, is free, and all that data will be free. And we're just, f the, 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 the people in charge of the survey are finalizing their report. And there's going to be a briefing to the international af uh, affairs team in in, uh, uh, in the Scottish government. I'm hoping also that a couple of the parliamentary commissions will be interested in hearing more about this as well, because I think it's fascinating. Had we found, I think probably our chief interest really was to what extent are people in Scotland interested in international politics? To what extent do they feel a stake in it? To what extent do they feel uh, that they understand some of these big questions, like, for example, uh, what, what was going on in Ukraine? That was one of the questions. What Scotland's responsibility, Scotland's attitudes towards multilateral organizations, which is a big theme that, uh, that I'm very keen to promote as a way, which I haven't mentioned yet, but you know, there are a lot of multilateral organizations that Scotland could, would do very well, I think, to try and uh, uh, promote and also to have a voice within. That, that you know, from everything from the UN to uh, the organization for the OECD and, and some of these 
the, the, these these uh, spaces where nations come together and state interests are put aside for common for, for, to, to, for, to, to realize common objectives. I think these are very important to support. Okay, thanks. I've got two speakers way up the back. Was it right in the very back row? Was that yourself? No? Okay. Well, then we'll go immediately where you are then, and then I've got a couple of people. We'll come back down. Thanks. Hi. Thanks, panel. That was great. Um, my name's Lewis. I'm from Scotland. Um, uh, I suppose my question is about our level of honesty in Scotland, about how we act, how we view our own history, the connection between our domestic policy goals and our external facing reputation. Uh, and I just want to give a couple of statistics. So the poverty rate amongst uh, single parents who are from a minoritized ethnic community is almost 50% in Scotland. That's almost double what it is for white people. Um, our, 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 our thoughts around and our political narrative around the common wheel in Scotland and our connection to social justice is so far removed from our historic connections to colonialism. And I think you've really touched it, both Tabitha and Maya, on, on, on the need to think about that connection to slave trade, but not just the slave trade, everything that came after it as well. And the, the lingering legacies of colonialism and the impact that has on people and the trauma that that, 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 that causes people of all uh, colors across the world. Um, and I suppose the question, therefore, is, is, is how can we counter that productively? How can we enter into a conversation about the Ukraine war, for example, that is honest about the fact that most people are more interested in the Ukraine war than they are in the aftermath of the evacuation of, of, of Afghans uh, only shortly before the war broke out? Our relationship with refugees, depending on their colour, where they're from, is such an important thing to self-interrogate. Yet I don't see that happening in politics. I don't see that on the news at 10 p.m. So what do we do to counter that? How do we get that into public debate? Okay, who wants to kick off with that? I think um, we start with um, having an honest, actually first of all, creating a safe space for these conversations to happen. Um, a lot of these conversations are not happening simply because one, people don't actually understand or know enough history to be able to comment on it. And then two, people don't want to offend. And even if they feel like they're right, they don't want to say it in case someone else says, well, you, you shouldn't have thought that or you shouldn't have said that. You know, so we're not having these conversations because we don't want to offend people. You know, we don't want to, and I'll give a, an example. If myself and Peter are walking down the street and someone is to say, oh, I saw a gentleman and a lady walking down the street. Well, what did they look like? Well, it was a white man and he was wearing a jacket. What did the lady look like? Uh, she was wearing lots of beads. What else? Um, she was five foot five. What else? There's that thing about saying she was black. And people are so scared to have that conversation. And I think we need to have the honest conversation. And the only way we can have that honest conversation is by creating a safe space and creating a platform where we can have this uncomfortable conversation. Because they're not really uncomfortable. It's just people don't know how to deal with that. People don't, how, don't know how to deal with these conversations. So create that safe space where people can ask questions without being penalized. People can ask questions without being challenged. People can ask questions and receive an honest answer. You've mentioned the war in Ukraine. We cannot mention what's happening. I've not had anyone mention about what's happening in the Congo. Not had anyone mention what's happening in Libya. We've not had people mentioning what's happening in Iraq. We're not, you know, so we're so selective about the conversations we're having. And we can't choose, if we're gonna be honest, good citizens, and not just honest, good Scottish citizens, global citizens. We have to have these uncomfortable conversations in order to be each other's keepers. And the only way we can do that is creating an environment that is safe to have these conversations. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You want to come in? I, think I completely agree 100%. And I think just to add on that, when creating the safe spaces, it doesn't need to be in, any, in an organization. It can be with your friends. It could be with your family, it could be with somebody you've met at the bus stop, or you've had made a comment. It starts really small and it grows. It's all about creating and having this, the conversation and not being scared to ask <laughs> and to be corrected or to relearn or unlearn 
behaviors and attitudes and unconscious bias because there is a lot of unconscious bias that we all have um, in terms of that. But going back into education, there's a big push to decolonize the curriculum and that's some so, so of the work I'm working in within Glasgow Caledonian University and looking at how we can look at the curriculum and how it could welcome having such discussions even in the classroom and being able to have that through research as well because when we're looking at our REF, uh, which are our research outcomes and looking at what sort of things our researchers are looking at, are they looking at only issues that affect one sort of group of people? rather than other sort of people. So it becomes really hard to research because there's no peer review, because there's no one researching about a certain country and doing certain things. So also just going back at looking at such um, projects that are happening in higher education, like, as I've said, uh, decolonizing the curriculum, trying to go through institutions and looking at institutional racism and how you're contributing to it in one way or another, or we're all contributing to it, because there's so many little niche things that are happening within society that we're not aware of, but they do actually add on to institutionalized racism. And they won't stop until somebody calls them out or until you face them yourselves and then you realize, oh, this, there's an issue here. So it's also about going and educating yourself. I know you've said you've not seen things in the news. Stop watching or change the stations you're watching. Watch African news. They're all in English, most of them, or if not, there's subtitles. So you can go and check what's happening or what's the news in Kenya, what's the news in Nigeria, in Niger, in Libya. And then that sort of takes away the bias. So you don't only have to stick to BBC and STV and CNN and all those, because those will always sell the narrative that they want to sell about all these countries. And then you always think negatively. So just educate yourself as well, just to add on what Maya said. Yeah. yeah, and I think I should say that my colleague Foisal Chowdhury has just arrived uh, at the very back and it, by sheer chance you started talking about colonialism and the need to do more education in schools and Foisal's been doing a lot of that, asking difficult questions and just raising the issue generally. Um, and one of the things that I found interesting was the um, National Museum is now going to do an exhibition on colonialism and it was interesting that it involved different diaspora groups in Edinburgh on what their personal experiences in their families were. So that was a point that came up right at the start about people's own families. Yeah. And I think that diversity we've got in Scotland, so very good timing, Foisal. If you're going to make a comment, you'll need a mic, and it needs to be brief and not a speech. Because <laughs> I've got two questioners that are coming down the corridor here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for uh, giving me this opportunity to get in. Yes, I, I did come in good time, and the point you've just raised is very important. Uh, recently, as Sarah said, I've been raising these issues, and I've been having meetings with uh, school, colleges, and universities, and I think we need to start this dialogue from very young age, from primary level, and we need to add that in our curriculum. If, uh, the, if students know the history they can be a better person. So uh, I welcome uh, any other input, and I will be working on this with uh, my colleague Sarah and other colleagues as well. So uh, if you want to get involved with us, uh, you're more than welcome. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I think it was not just primary school, but preschool as well. No pressure, Foisel. Okay. Now, lady in blue there, were you next? And then the lady in black. Sorry, Peter, will you want to come in? I'll take you next. Uh, yeah, Briefly, uh, I just question. wanted to, I mean, I think I've, I've, I, I think it's pretty, I hope I've made clear that I'm very supportive of thinking uh, of what connects Scotland to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be either or in the way that you seem to be suggesting. In other words, for the same reason that Niger is of particular concern to uh, the, the African nations surrounding Niger, and, and, the, and they've uh, taken responsibility for uh, trying to find a peaceful and democratic solution to the crisis there. It's entirely understandable that Northern Europe is going to be concerned with Ukraine. And I don't think it's, it's, it's reasonable to be critical of that and, or to say it's racist. It's not racist. It's only racist if you say Ukraine's more important because the people are white. And, and, and nobody, no responsible person in Scotland is saying that. And so, I mean, Scotland, whether you like it or not, its geopolitical position facing into the North Sea makes security and defense a question it cannot ignore. 
I have to, I'm going to have to just jump in without Sarah's <laughs> so, and agree and, and disagree a little bit with, um, with my colleague uh, Peter here, um, simply because I don't think it's anything to do with the, with the, with the, with the, race, with the race and uh, um, as such. I think it's just the omission of truth, that there's a difference. When one becomes, uh, Ukraine was such a big talking point and now Niger is such a big talking point because 80% of France and relies on its uranium and 50% of the US relies on it. And so now it's become a talking point. So I don't think it's anything to do with the race element. It's just the omission of some parts of truth or just parts that are missed out that we don't get to see unless you've done a little bit of more research. That information is not given to you. So you don't get to see what else can we do? You know, if you were to say, right now, Niger needs support, what else can we do? You wouldn't know about it unless the media has put something out there. The media put a lot of information about Ukraine and Scotland ran out. We sent trucks of clothes and food and volunteers to Ukraine because they needed help. There is no in the news where there's been an article that says, the people of Niger need help because the US has cut off their aid. Let's rally and do something. The moment we have that conversation, as honest as possible, then we're being a good citizen. The moment we have a conversation that my great grandfather was involved in the world wars, we can then have a conversation. But the moment we choose to miss out specific people and the moment we choose to miss out specific truths, then we can't begin to be a good citizen because we're choosing to, we're missing the parts that make us our brothers and sisters keepers. Our brothers and sisters keeper, you're not my brother because you're the same color as me. You could be the same color of me, uh, as me, but that doesn't make you loyal to me. You could be a different color to me and you're the most loyal person I'll ever meet. Brothers keepers, sisters keeper is someone who is willing to risk their life because they believe that what they have to do to support you supersedes anything else. And that, doesn't, that should not look at the race and shouldn't look at color, it should look at humanity for as long as we have got level truth on both bases. Okay. There's a lady who's now got the mic. Do you want to give us your name and then fire Hello. away? Hello. Yeah, my name's Diana and thank you very much, Maya, for that. That was really, really good to hear. Um, so I'm here with my colleague Charlotte and we are representing the International Development Education Association of Scotland, um, of which Scottish Fair Trade Forum are, are one of, there's about 23 members. And my colleague Charlotte here is the chair. And we work for development education centres and development education is a kind of old phrase which now in schools they talk about global citizenship education. So it was very encouraging for us to hear you talk frequently about this need for education. And it's something that we've been doing for many, many years. So it's something that's embedded in schools, global citizenship education. But more recently, the links to race equality, the links to decol decolonizing the curriculum, that's, I would say, just in the last four or five years that that's become really important. And I loved what you were saying about that, um, the er getting right in there early years. And I think the the further education and higher education as well. It's those sort of ends where we can start to make the connections all the way through to build that the progression on the learning. Um, so we're based in Glasgow, our development education centre, but there is one in the Highlands, Maya, that really encourage you to connect with. They'd love to hear from you. And uh, Peter, if you find yourself doing a wee tour, let us know because we're already working with schools. We're already we're doing that work. This morning, in fact. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. I'm going to pass to Charlotte. So, so I just wanted to, um, I'm Charlotte, um, and I'm based in the Edinburgh Centre. But I really help, um, wanted to ask a question as well, because, you know, there's a, a lot of talk today about education and young people. Um, but teachers themselves don't have the knowledge. They don't have the confidence to have these conversations. They don't have necessarily the time and the curriculum um, because the, particularly the higher up they go, there's pressures of exams. So I guess my question is, and as Diana said, we've been working in this field for a while. 
Um, I was working with a, a teacher only this week um, about developing an anti-racist curriculum in her school. This is like the second three-hour training she's given to it, and now she's given other hours across the whole of this year to develop it. And she is kind of saying to me, my teachers do not know how to do this. They just do not know how to do this. And this is one school in Edinburgh that I have given about, I don't know, 12 hours of my time to in terms of training. So, and I'm one person. I can't do that to every school in Edinburgh, let alone for other local authorities who work in. So my question is, if this is going to happen, how and where and who is going to enable teachers to find the time and have the training in order for this to happen because it always comes down to oh education needs to do it and teachers can't do everything and if they are going to do this how are we going to support and enable them that to happen who wants to kick off there's a bit of nodding going on the platform you'll be glad to hear no, absolutely i think um, i do agree with you because I, I, I obviously work within race equality and um, I've been within the field for many, many years. So I was a student when I started working on this and I was doing it as a volunteer. And the, a lot of the people I was working with also were taken out of their day jobs. So it also goes down to resourcing. So like my role was created and our institution had to look for resource to get me there so I'm able to do it full time. So it's going down to institutions actually looking for experts or people who are in the way to become experts and looking for that resource to add them there to add on to it because me then joining this institution has added that level of you don't have to take five hours more off your day because i can do it because it's my day job and being able to to give that access and i do agree that um it is a lot of a lot to ask of teachers and educators to take off time and learn all these new skills but it's also understanding the importance of them wanting to and not having to feel like they have to so it's more we want to change our, our how we are as a people and how our next generation is taught and how they view themselves as global citizens and being able to use in many ways whatever you're already doing as an educator and maybe tweaking one book in, 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 in your class or one sort of assessment you give so it's what small small things like that that could then build up but again it all goes down to resourcing and getting people who want to rather than have to do it yeah more nodding i've got a slightly different <laughs> i've got a different approach uh, i said if i was i and this has always been my 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 response um if i was given the authority to do this i would implement this straight away someone who works in as an eyp i could totally understand your frustration because one the paperwork you have to write everything and it's really difficult to talk about something that you have no experience in no lived experience so it becomes very very difficult to make it a personal situation my solution and this is a challenge i'll give to our um, politicians who make decisions we have got uh, refugees we have got people who have come into this country uh, for whatsoever reason they cannot access public funds they're skilled, they have got degrees, masters and PhDs. Um, they're waiting for their immigration issues to be sorted out. Why not use them and their skills in that department? We have teachers, we have lecturers. Why don't you say, actually, you're a teacher, you've got, we can do a PV, PVG for you and make sure that you know you qualify in whatever parts you need to qualify in. And if you give us 10 hours a month to come and teach our young group around race equality or whatever you need to do about history, whatever you need to do, because you have the lived experience. That removes the pressure from that teacher who one has to go and do the research and then has to go and talk about a topic that can be uncomfortable and they don't know what they're talking about and they have to try and deliver it so that anyone who's in that who in, is in that room can relate it's really really difficult if you are a white person trying to tell a black person about the slave trade and have that conversation they're like what but it's very very different if it comes from another black person and you know i hope that makes sense you know so it's easy for these are things that the government can do to utilize the resources, I'm talking about the resources that we have, utilize the resources that we've got, utilize the people that we've got, utilize the skills that we have got on the ground, 
get them to come and work in schools, get them to come and give talks, let them have workshops. But again, they're using their, their, their land experience and their lived experiences and also the expertise of wherever country they've come from. And they can use that to deliver, uh, to deliver workshops in schools. And then that removes the pressure from teachers. Okay. That's the first bit of spontaneous applause today. Not bad. <laughs> uh, and about using people's skills and knowledge. How do we do that? That's a really good point. Where's the mic gone? There. Uh, there's a lady right in the front. Second in here. If you want to give us your name and a question. Thank you. Thank you. Irene Matthews, former educator, um, comparatist. Uh, I would like to just endorse very much what's recently been said about uh, educating educators. I recently had a personal experience of a couple of years at Glasgow University in a humanities course. At the time that Glasgow University was lauding itself for its attitudes and renewed interest in the aftermath of slavery and the responsibility of the university itself in utilizing the profits from the slave trade in order to subsidize their own colleges, um, on the ground, in the classroom, zero absolutely nothing, including even a defensiveness among the professors who were teaching if you brought up context. It simply wasn't tolerated. They either didn't have the knowledge or they were embarrassed by the topics or they wanted to be specialists. And this is one of the problems, again, not so much at high school and uh, primary school level, but after in and after university undergraduate courses, we're finding a lot of specialization which really does lose track. And I think globalization has a lot to do with context. We have to understand the larger context in which we're living. However, that's, I'm sorry, that isn't what I really wanted to ask about or mention. Um, I would like to come back to the idea of uh, the media and their responsibility in somehow giving us some actual information about the rest of the world. It's wonderful that there are specialized stations broadcasting from various different countries, but our own national media, and by national I'm referring to the United Kingdom, um, seems to want to concentrate on catalogues of catastrophe and poverty press. So. For example, Niger, yes, is in the news right now, but what do we know about the daily lives of a person from Niger when they are not at war, or they're not down a mine, or they're not being assaulted in some way or another? Practically nothing, because once again, the everyday media does not offer us a vision of the world. Now, I don't know what we do about that. I would have loved to have had somebody here today, in addition to this wonderful expert opinion, someone who was perhaps a little less expert and would be able to justify the lack of general contextual news about our brothers and sisters all over the world, because this focus on catastrophe is, does not serve anybody. The focus on history is valuable, but what's happening now? So I just wanted to mention that I feel that our, me our mainstream media really, really lets us down, as does some of our elite educational approach and focus, which is also way too narrow. So, Siri, that was a complaint, not a question. But, okay. Um, <laughs> kind of makes a nice point that we live in a democracy, so you get to ask difficult, awkward questions. But as part of the point of this is to actually have a proper discussion. So thanks for that, Irene. Anyone want to come back on that? I'm thinking about media and thinking, apart from the Guardian newspaper, there's very few newspapers give you any of this kind of coverage at all. Um, any thoughts anyone's got? Well, I think that uh, one of the most important things we can do uh, and it, it involves speaking across across communities is uh, focusing on a, a better understanding of empire. You know, I live in Glasgow, and Glasgow is suffused with 
monuments from an imperial era. And there's still, I think, a tendency even amongst, there must be amongst high school teachers to talk about teach empire as something to be proud of rather than something that was fundamentally exploitative and, and uh, uh, unjust and has had reverberating effects down through the centuries and decades that, that have left us with you know, really profound structural challenges in, in our societies that are, I think, in many ways a product of, of, of empire. And so that's one of our, our aims. And I really have to, I think, uh, present another view. I'm not dismissing your experience at, at the University of Glasgow, but I am in the history department in Glasgow, and we have a huge and thriving global history program. We have a center of slavery studies, we ha which was kind of from the very beginning uh, uh, when students arrive, you know, they're taught a different, a different approach to empire, and they're taught, uh, you know, the meaning of slavery and how the slavery economy was far, far wider and more pervasive than we've usually understood. So, uh, I can only assure you that your experience is not. It's not. But what proportion it's not one. of the university students are in the history department, and to what extent do you also activate conversations? Etc. seminars across the university? Well, we try. Have you been to the Hunteria Museum? I mean, there's a great, great exhibition about slavery there right now. Slavery again? What about now? Yeah. <laughs> In order to understand where we are, we have to understand how we got here. So I don't understand. I mean, historians can only do history. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's been a lot of, there was somebody near the front here. Is that, yeah, we've moved on. Yeah, has anyone else got a question they want to go through? Right up the back, just that lady at the ed end of that row. Is it working? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Hi, I'm Amy, so I'm feeling I've got two young people here. <laughs> so my question really is, how do we engage, or how are the panel engaging young people's voices in this work? Because there's a sense of real urgency. You know, we're talking about history, we're talking about things which are, <clears throat> we can talk about that for a long, long time, but you know, these guys, we need to talk about what's happening now, how are their voices being included? Some of these conversations, I'm very sure it's the first time that they've heard these conversations happening. You know, they're 15, so, why is that? And how do we, when a, some interest is sparked around this, how do we encourage that and keep that moving? Okay, good question. Anyone want to kick off? Yeah, I'll start. In one of the organisations I'm paired with is the Fair Trade Forum, and I'm glad to see Martin in the audience. Um, and uh, they, they engage with young children and bring in fair trade within education in schools so young kids are able to participate in different fair trade activities and I, I went to one a couple of years ago and it was really nice to see these really young primary school kids working with rice that they've got in that it's fair trade and trying to sell it to their teachers and to their families and just understanding how fair trade impacts on, on the economy and the global and being a good global citizen. So organizations are working. I think it's just more so it needs to be more put out there that this is what's going on and also maybe creating a platform where young people or networks for young people. I know we're working um, through the Fair Trade Forum as well to get young people more engaged in our work and make it more engaging and more um, less formal and less serious just to get people in there. Because we do know young people are into activism and being part of being part of the prop of the solution because you saw when like for example black lives matter happened in 2020 it was a young people leading it when all these things have been happening climate change it's all been young people so they're ready to be engaged it's just how do organizations engage them in a way that's not daunting in a way that's not too serious or too um you can't express yourself as it should be you're following policies and procedures and you know trying to make it too formal and just being able to 
again within friends groups i think it's always good when you find friends with the same ideas and then google and find organizations or look into your local community and find organizations that are doing all this good work but there are organizations that are doing things for young kids i think it's just more so advertising more of it and creating networks for young people to tap into all these I think the other thing I would add is that we've also got the Scottish Youth Parliament and I know from talking to the local reps that they quite often do local events and local meetings to try and give young people that chance to have their voice heard. So there's something about it. it's almost like seizing the opportunity I think and finding out who's doing what um, and then trying to mainstream it and get more coverage all of that as well. Certainly when we get lobbied by students they are very conscious of these kind of issues and they're starting to lobby us quite effectively I think. So I think it's, it's, it's trying to seize the opportunities as well with some of this stuff um, and try and get the change that I think everyone in the room wants us to have. Um, I don't see any more hands up. Oh, I see one hand at the front and then, but first off, you come in. I'll just answer again a little bit on, um, on the young people side of it. Um, with, uh, with the organisation I found it was again simply because there was just nothing for young people in the Highlands and I think there's nothing worse when we try to tell young people what should be done and how we should be done and there's not a lot of invol involvement with the young people themselves. Um, so what we try to do is have more workshops. Uh, in the Highlands there's only one book called Hand of Surprise on Diversity. One book and every library has got it. So we try to have workshops, uh, we try to have um, um, dance classes, we run youth groups and as, we try and do as much as we can within a very limited budget because we're struggling with funding and we don't seem to get a lot of funding for stuff we want to do with the young people. Um, so mainly workshops, uh, mainly workshops, uh, youth groups, crafts, storytelling, open mics. Uh, we get um, dance crews that come from Glasgow to come to the Highlands and do workshops with the young people and we find that that is another way for them to, to interact. Uh, we do stuff with hair braiding, we do stuff with um, cloth making with, with, uh, with African fabric. Uh, so if we get young designers who are really, who want to work in, in design but we want to to, uh, to promote African fabrics. We include that in, um, in, the, in the workshops that we're working on. Um, so we try to make our workshops more youth focused and youth led um, and let them kind of lead the way. So that's what we try to do around the young people. And we just, we're just there in the background and let them run the show as such. Okay, and question, I see two questions now near the front. I'll take one and then I'll take the next one and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, sorry, I'm Sarah. I used to um, actually speak for fair trade in schools and, and colleges and things like that. And actually, the way I would present it is, is you know, who has the power? So you go, I go, you know, I'd explain like how the economy sort of works, how there's these massive buying chairs and, you know, Tesco buys this and um, the people who manufacture things, they make decisions as, you know, but who ultimately has the power? And I would hand this back to the children and they'd be going, oh, you know, it's Tesco, it's Cadbury, it's the... And I'm like, no, you, because you are buying the product. We are all responsible global citizens in, when we make conscious decisions about what we buy. You know, so we, we have a tremendous amount of power in our own hands day after day just by making simple decisions and if we can get that across to our young people and if we can make them understand that the process th that goes into making your shoes or making your clothing you know um issues about climate change are connected to issues of um i'm sorry to say present day virtual slavery you know which does exist around the world in the way that garment industry produces clothing issues of um you know how farmers are are, are made to pay additional money for, for for um kind of crops all of those issues that we take for granted handing that back to our children to empower them to become conscious consumers that that is what makes a good global citizen. And that's the kind of very, very basic level. And there are a, a ton of organizations out there who are willing to go and speak in schools, who have this knowledge, you know, fr from their, their daily work. And it, 
we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not trying to <laughs> teach people something that is kind of complex or complicated. It's just an understanding of this interconnectivity of, of how things are made, where they're produced, and the kind of the way that that interacts with our, our daily lives and our daily decisions with everything that we buy. So, yep. And then right behind, I think that was a really empowering comment, as you can tell by the claps. Hi, um, my name is Rosa. I had, um, I had a question, but also just wanted to make a brief um, uh, response to what, what you just said, which I think is um, a really good point. And obviously, like consumer decisions do um, have a big impact on, on you know, what companies do and, and what products you see and whatnot. But I think one of the issues there um, is that unfortunately a lot of the ethical choices end up being quite um, prohibitively expensive for a lot of people or they're not um, available in certain areas or some things where it's like, oh, eat better. It's like, if you do it right, it's very inexpensive. You can eat vegetables for cheap. Um, some people live in places where they, they can't buy vegetables. Um, they don't, you know, it, it's not feasible for them. And um, sure, it's cheap, but how much time does it take to prepare this? You know, that's another thing. If you have a bunch of kids, if you're working multiple jobs, um, you know, even if something costs the same as, as um, even if a, um, a meal costs the same as like a, a fast food thing, you know, what's, what's the time cost and stuff like that. Um, you know, like there's a, a refillery, a plastic free shop right by where I live. And um, I looked at how, for some things it's like, okay, that price is reasonable, but I looked at how much would it cost me to buy pasta there. And it would be like three or more, three or four more times expensive than going to Little. Um, so I'm not poor, but I'm still like, that's not something that's available to me at the moment. Um, so this isn't to be like, oh, rain on your parade, like y nobody can do that, it's not realistic. But I think it's something that um, isn't in the conversation as much as it should be. And then some, like, for example, sometimes you have people saying like, oh, well, you know, like minorities or migrant communities, like they don't care about the environment. Look at all the stuff they're buying. They're not buying sustainable things. Um, they're just buying the cheapest stuff they can. You know, this is something that I, I do hear quite a lot of people saying that. And it's like, again, well, especially if you're living in more um, deprived areas, like do you, do you have access to these types of things? Um, some people can't just like pop on the internet and do research about, oh, is this company ethical? Is that company ethical? Um, so I'm not at all trying to, to diminish what you, you said, um, just something that I think should be brought to the conversation and part of the thing also then being how, how do we make these things more accessible? Um, you know, how can we make it so it's easier for people to buy fresh produce or um, some people might not even just know how to cook or, or all of these things. Um, so I suppose like anything, it's an incredibly complicated thing with no easy solution. Um, this isn't to say that like all things are expensive. You know, you can, if you buy secondhand clothes then you're not contributing to that industry and it's cheaper. Um, but again, lots of things in there that um, don't always come into the, the conversation. Um, my initial question was about the workshops. Um, I was really curious about um, just kind of how you've designed those um, because I know like there's so many different approaches to that and some are just going to make people's eyes glaze over. Um, so it sounds like you've just done really amazing work there. So I'm, I'm curious to um, if you would if you would be willing to expand on that a bit. Everything that we try and do within our organization is from lived experiences and from uh, yeah, lived experiences really. Um, so what we've, we've done with the workshops, um, we've Go, the dance group is, uh, is, is a group of uh, dancers who come from Glasgow and they'll come to the Highlands and they'll do the workshops that way. And then the storytellers, again, some of them are authors themselves, so they'll bring their books there and we'll do, we'll do that. The poetry again, it, it's people's own work and we'll just arrange a meet, we'll just arrange um, a venue, we'll get together and we'll use that as an opportunity to be able to engage with other, with, uh, with other people. Um, we also go around to, to schools because again, as I said, I'm an EYP, um, so it's allowed me to go to different schools and we can have um, storytelling, we can have uh, cultural days. Um, so we use the opportunities of being able to go to different schools um, to get the message we need to get across, as well as just using uh, our friendship circle to then invite. We, we did have, uh, last year we had um, the Black History Month and um, 
I'm always cutting the fence on Black History Month. There's no, you can't teach everything you need to teach in one month. It's just not possible. And I wish we had this every single day. And so in that time, you know, our target was to have about 150 people in the Highlands. There's not a lot of black people in the Highlands. So 150 people, we were like, okay, we're going with 150. And so we got the venue and we ended up with 475 the venue couldn't cope so we had to say you know and it wasn't even the majority of them weren't black people the majority of them were white people who just wanted to learn and who just wanted to know more and because of that this the workshops have expanded um and just gone from group to group to group okay. that is really good that's a, i think that's a really good positive point to finish on i'm going to give all of our speakers a minute each so uh, to kind of wind up in terms of what you take away from the day. And I'm going to go in reverse order, so um, try to think who I got first. Peter, you came last in the first slot. Oh. So what's your, what's your final concluding thoughts in a minute? Because there's been so much raised this afternoon. Well, I think uh, to stress once again that, that sense of interconnectedness. It's very, very important to understand that a lot of the challenges facing humanity are global challenges, and they face all of humanity and they require a solution where everyone uh, has a way to contribute. I also think, uh, just just respond to what you said just a moment ago, if there was anything good that came out of the by-election in, in uh, uh, West London a few weeks ago, it was a realization that we can't impose climate policies on the back of poor people in fact, we all have to make a sacrifice together, and and uh, we need to think more. I think in a more reflective way. Obviously, there's going to be an attempt to exploit, exploit, and try to try and play down the importance of climate policy. But I think if we have uh, more more rounded solutions which take into account how we can bring the entire British population and the entire world population with us, when we impose and uh, uh, measures that are going to be necessary to prevent what I think is a rolling acute climate emergency, that will only be to, to, to the good. Okay, thanks. Um, next up, Maya, what are you thinking? Scotland's a global citizen. What are you taking away from today? What do we do? I think, um, you know, I, had, I once had someone say that... Um, Blood doesn't make you family, loyalty does. And in this kind of situation, what I take away from this, or what I would even actually encourage everyone to think about um, when it, in terms of being a global citizen, is we are each other's family. And we're not connected by blood, uh, we're not connected by loyalty, we're connected by humanity. And what we do now might not impact us now, but it'll impact the generations to come. And they can look back and just say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad they decided to work together as humanity because we now have this amazing place to live in or we can become so divided and we can fight against each other and then everything will just crumble. So we can either work together as humanity, as life was intended for us to be, and, um, and just create something amazing for the generations to come. Okay, thank you very much. And you get the last word. Absolutely, I'll keep mine very short and sweet. I'll just say, I think there's a lot of passion around being global citizens within the room, and that's really good to see. And I've picked up on so much um, engagement on different issues that per uh, pertain being a global citizen. So I think it's more so knowing that Yes, maybe Scotland is a good global citizen, but there's still a long way for it to go before they can claim that they're a great global citizen. So the passion's in the room, and it's up to us, the people in the room, to actually start those grassroots um, ob uh, objectives and for the MSPs in the room to do the big jobs for us as well. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> No, that's fantastic. Look, I think we've had superb panellists today. Um, so I want a big round of applause for Tabitha, Peter and Maya. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> but how do we make Scotland a good global citizen? And there was quite a lot of recurring themes, and one of them was about us as individuals. What do we all do, both individually, collectively, 
what are our influences? I don't know if everyone, anyone's been to see Take One Action, the, the radical film campaign group. See, when you leave one of their films, you have to go and in your head say, what is the one action I'm going to do after today? So I'm going to send that thought out. What can everyone in this room do? So you've got three or four local councillors, depending where you stay in Scotland. What is the local fair trade policy in your council area? Um, what's happening in schools? That was a conversation that came up a lot, schools and preschool. Um, you've got one local MSP and seven regional list MSPs. You've got one MP. And next up are the UK elections. So you actually have an opportunity to influence this discussion as to how we make Scotland as good a global citizen as we can be. And in the Parliament, we've got one or two opportunities. If you have spare time, I want to thank Louise from the Scottish International Development Alliance because she helped craft today, get our speakers organised and think of our themes. And we have a cross-party group um, that's coming up very soon, 19th of September, where we've got our International Development Minister coming along, Christina McKelvey, and we're going to be asking her some soft intro questions, and then we're going to grill her on things like this. What more can we do in Scotland? How do we spend our money in international development? Um, I was told today that the next day, Francis Guy, who's part of the, the Global Campaign Network, uh, there's a global citizenship event on the 20th of September in Dynamic Earth, so Google that. Uh, the 7th of November, we've got our next cross-party group in international development. But if you're interested in all of that, go on the Parliament website, put out your social media. We've got a cross-party group in fair trade. Um, I think Martin is in the room. Uh, you're involved in helping that work. And it's thinking about how do we make this happen? Changing our education, changing how we do business, all that stuff about fair trade. The point was made, it's not just fair trade, it's where do we buy our clothes, how much does stuff cost, um, what contracts do our local authorities, uh, what contracts does our NHS have, where does the food come from. There's lots and lots of ways in which we can make a change. So I'm going to pick away, I'm not going to just do one take one action obviously, because you've put too many questions on for me. I'm going to be networking with colleagues local level, UK level and in the Parliament. But let's think collectively because we want to be proud of being in Scotland and we could do a hell of a lot more to make the world a better place from the points that were made about poverty in Scotland to poverty across the globe. So let's think about how we use our own agency, organisations you're in, where if you've got a job, what does your company do, what does your organisation do? Let's get our voices heard and we're in a democracy so we can say what we think, you can say what we think, and we can work together. So thank you all for coming. It's been a great discussion. Um, and thanks, everyone, on the platform. Fantastic. Great.